one of my fundamental human rights to have the freedom of speech, then we actually talk about the issue of national sovereignty and human rights. And before we go on to this in more detail and more depth, let's clarify and let's define some of the main issues and words in today's debate. Human rights. When we speak of human rights, we refer to a set of inalienable codes and principles, principles to which individuals are entitled. A set of personal entitlements, such as those to the entitlement to speech, the freedom to life, dissent, a fair and free trial, such as those set out in, for example, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Now let's go on to the other topic, the one of national sovereignty. Now we define national sovereignty as the concept by which the political authority and jurisdiction of a government over a country is recognized, where you allow government to handle, to have control over the jurisdiction and over matters that, are, that occur within a nation, over matters that pertain specifically to the citizens of a nation. And when we talk about intervention in the case of national sovereignty, we talk about intervention by bodies, intervention by bodies like the United Nations, by the IMF, by ASEAN. Now let's go on to look at the last point, the idea of sacrifice. Now when we speak of sacrifice, we refer to the giving up of something in view of a more pressing need. So what would we like to clarify in today's debate? Number one, we would like to say that when we sacrifice national sovereignty, we are not talking about a complete and absolute removal of it. Rather, we tell you that then weighed up with the issue of human rights, we would prioritize human rights over national sovereignty. We do agree that yes, both are important, but like I said, when you weigh them up, we tell you that human rights should be given the priority. Secondly, throughout this debate, we will be referring to scenarios where there is actually some sort of clash, where there is a clash between the issues of national sovereignty and human rights. We will not be talking about, and we cannot open this debate to areas where these two situations actually coexist, because then we say that there would be a moot, and there would really be no issue of sacrificing one over the other. Thirdly, we are not advocating the arbitrary military invasion with the aim of conquest of one country and one organization into others. Rather, we tell you, we would talk about interventions through organizations like UN, and other regional bodies, even in the case of single nation intervention. What are the nation by the way? No, thank you, sir. We see that this intervention is done on the ground of humanitarianism, with the specific purpose of preventing and alleviating the widespread suffering or death of people. Now, what will we deal? How will we show this to you throughout the course of today's debate? Now, as first speaker, I will deal with the alleviation of problems that comes about with recognizing and prioritizing human rights. Secondly, the prevention of entrenchment of abuses that result. My second speaker will speak of the signals that are sent out when the sacrifice is made. Our third speaker will further the case. And as a team, we will prove how <coughs> sacrificing national sovereignty in the face of human rights will result in the protection of the welfare of society. Now let's go on to the first issue, the alleviation of problems. Now what we will tell you is that with human rights abuses, people of a country, the nation is put through lots of tension, lots of suffering. All you have to do is look at Aceh and East Timor to see the hundreds of thousands of people who were killed and who were murdered. No, sir. Now we tell you that in these cases, when you examine it, it is clear that the government is not capable enough to deal with these human rights abuses and human rights Final issues. Information, yes, sir. And that is why they invited the UN peacekeepers in, which is not an infringement of sovereignty at all. Thank you, sir. Sir, please, look at the fact that we are talking about the fact that when we speak of national sovereignty and when we speak of human rights, we would say that this intervention is sanctioned, is allowed, both by the country and the organization that carries it out and by the country that is being no, thank you, sir. The country that is being entered into. We say that this is allowed by both of these entities. Now, what we tell you is that even in some instances you have the government being the perpetrator of these abuses. So therefore we tell you that by sacrificing national secure national sovereignty for human rights. By putting human rights above national sovereignty, you are directly protecting and ensuring the safety of the people. Look, no, thank you, sir. Look at Freetown in Africa. Look at how Fode Sanko and his nation-building troops have killed hundreds, have 
killed thousands of people on the streets, ladies and gentlemen. We tell you that once we see the UN coming in, we see the UN actually addressing these problems and working towards their alleviation. No thank you, sir. So again, we tell you that with this, with recognizing the importance of these human rights over that of national sovereignty, you are actually putting into motion a sequence of events that addresses the situation. Why? Because you allow for the fighting to stop. You allow the acts of conflict to stop. Madam, yes, sir. When we impose arbitrary armistice, what you allow is for them to regroup and rearm themselves. Sir, sir, do listen. I did say, and we've already pointed out the fact that we are not allowing, we do not smile upon arbitrary invasions. We are talking about intervention where there is an actual goal, an actual goal Not towards some sort of peace being obtained. No, thank you, sir. So we tell you that when you address it, when you allow, for example, relief agencies like the Red Cross and organizations to come in, you allow the, res the restoration of structure, the supply of food and medicine. Again, you see that you are helping to alleviate the situation brought about by the abuse of human rights. Another point in this, actually, is that with human rights abuse, you also have the issue of refugees of refugees fleeing from the country with, this, with the human rights abuse problems to other countries. We tell you, you have deaths along the way, you have diseases, you have displacement of people. Look at the issue in Kosovo. The fact that refugees spilt over into neighboring countries, spilt over into Macedonia. We tell you that it was only, sir, it was only after UN intervention that refugees find it stable enough in Kosovo to return, to return to their countries. No thank you, sir. So again, we see that the welfare of these refugees was protected once you had the recognizing of the human rights abuse. A small extension to this would be the fact that we need immediate intervention because you need to prevent these abuses from being deeply entrenched from the very beginning. And you need to prevent these interventions from, a, from becoming a cycle and perpetuating a dangerous way of life. And the more and more they are entrenched and the more and more these issues are not addressed, but are put under national sovereignty, you will see that it becomes more and more difficult to alleviate these situations with time. Look at Pol Pot and Cambodia. The fact that the killing fields, in the killing fields, millions and millions of people were dying. And because of the fact that the UN and other organizations went in too late, they went in too late and there was no immediate response to the situation, you saw that the problem could not be addressed. So really, ladies and gentlemen, we see that because we need, we need to address the fact of human rights abuse before we can begin to address the issue of national sovereignty. And because we see that sacrificing national sovereignty over, so sacrificing national sovereignty in the face of human rights helps in the protection of the welfare of our society. Now, Mr. Lee Hong, a very good afternoon. Now, when we look at the definitions of the government, we found that they were very, very sadly confused. Now, members of the House, the first speaker of Hini came out and she told us that there is no sacrifice if you talk about national sovereignty and human rights being upheld in the same place. And we tell her, yes, we tell you that that is not a sacrifice. So when we clarify the concept of sacrifice, members of the House, we tell you that if the peacekeepers are invited, if they are approved, ladies and gentlemen, by the domestic government, that they can come in, ladies and gentlemen, then there is no sacrifice of national sovereignty. And that was already implicitly considered on the part of the first government. And we therefore tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that that is the definition, that is the parameter that we're going to work with today. Now, having then cleared up the nitty-gritty detail, let us go on to what exactly the first government has been talking about. Now, she talked about how is it that intervention, humanitarian intervention, actually helps to alleviate the problems of the world. And we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that in my substantive, my I'm going to sir. show you how is it that humanitarian intervention exacerbates the problems. And not only that it exacerbates the problems, but there are also better alternatives. No, sir. So we tell the members of the House, quite simply, that we don't believe that it elevates the problem. We see, for example, how is it that in Rwanda, in Somalia, how is it that the peacekeeper armies that were sent in themselves, how is it, ladies and gentlemen, that they actually perpetuated human rights abuses themselves and they actually exacerbated the situation instead of actually solving it? No, sir. So we tell you, members of the House, that you can't just tell me the United Nations is going to have some degree of success and they give me no examples, give me no logic as to why that's going to happen because we tell you, members of the House, that there are viable alternatives. What? I'm going to tell you later, economic sanctions, international pressure, political negotiations, that is the way to go. 
Now, members of the House, then, what we see, ladies and gentlemen, is that they then brought up the example of how is it that human rights problems were indeed solved, for example, but the United States Nations stuff. actually went in, ladies and gentlemen, into the countries. And we tell you, no, madam, what happens more often than not, even in their own example that they say, when the United Nations came in, not only was the problem not solved, but it actually exacerbated and aggravated the problem of cross-national migrations, of which the bureaucracy <coughs> couldn't actually handle. So we tell you quite simply, members of the House, what do they mean when you talk about solution of problems? Do you just mean transporting our problems from one area to another? No, we tell you, members of the House, that is not what we want, because we're not going to shut away from the responsibility. What we're going to tell you, sir. members of the House, that what we want is for the people who have the local knowledge, who, ladies and gentlemen, will know how to distinguish from sectarian fragmentation to undertake, ladies and gentlemen, the kind of relief that you need for human rights abuses. No, sir. So, so members of the House, what we tell you quite simply, that on, this, on, this, on the other side of the House, when the government came up to us today, what they really, really told us was that somehow or another, the United Nations is good. The United Nations manages to do a lot of things. And we tell you, members of the House, no, we have better alternatives. And because we have better alternatives, we tell you that we believe, members of the House, that humanitarian intervention doesn't work. Right, and, sir. Later, and we tell you that we would not sacrifice national sovereignty for human rights. Yes, sir. And I'll tell you this, your other alternatives such as economic sanctions have had no effect on dictators in Africa. No, members of the House, it is quite strange considering since I have never ever talked about economic sanctions yet in detail that he should come out and then try to attack me on that. Quite pathetic, really. Now, members of the House, let us look, ladies and gentlemen, first at why is it that humanitarian intervention is ineffective. Now, I will show you how is it that, firstly, it exacerbates the situation because it is counterproductive and it breeds hostility and international tension. And secondly, the kind of policies that are effective, ladies and gentlemen, when they are ignorant of the local conditions, means that humanitarian intervention is not effective. No, thank you, sir. So, members of the House, let me go on to my first point. Point being, ladies and gentlemen, that it is counterproductive and that it breeds hostility and international tension. Let me tell you, members of the House, that more often than not, what happens is that when you send peacekeeping troops like this from the United Nations into the countries, no matter, you should listen to this, what happens, quite simply, is that it's far from solving the problem, you actually stir up nationalistic support from the people for, ladies and gentlemen, their dictator or their leader. For example, ladies and gentlemen, we see how is it that during the Gulf War, Saddam Hussein received huge people from the support, apart from sir. protests, apart from the intervention that came in from the United Nations. No, thank you, sir. And we tell you that he managed to very easily sleep within clusters of people because the local population refused to aid the United Nations because they saw the United Nations as encroaching upon the sovereignty on their nation. So, ladies and gentlemen, really, the point is not whether or not human rights per se or national sovereignty per se is important, but whether whether or not we can even solve the problem of human rights if we choose to violate the problem or violate the whole, the whole idea of national sovereignty. That is the point, Member City House. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we see, for example, that it doesn't stop there. We see how is it that the Serbian dictator, Radovan Karadzic, how is it that he received massive support from the Serbian population again against the, when the United Nations troops came in during the Bosnia-Herzegovina crisis. No, thank you, sir. So we tell you quite simply, members of the House, that far from solving the problem, what you're going to do is to whip up nationalistic support for the people from the dictator. And what's going to happen, ladies and gentlemen, your presence is not going to be welcome. The dictator is going to find it easily uh, find it great, uh, increasingly easier to disappear within the crowds of people, to disappear with the help of his people who refuse to work with international organisations. So we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that is not the way to go. The Why way to go, members of the House, is not through the foreign invasion that the people see happens. No, madam. The way to go, ladies and gentlemen, is through the kind of economic sanctions, the kind of political negotiations which allow the government, the domestic government itself, to carry out the kinds of reforms that are necessary to solve the human rights problems that we see. No, thank you, sir. So we tell you, members of the outset, not only that, let us now look on to the second prong. The concept and the idea that how is it that the policies that have been so that have, the policies that have been linked, ladies and gentlemen, with humanitarian intervention have quite obviously not worked. Why? Because they're ignorant of the local conditions. They are unable, for example, to separate the <coughs> warring factions that are in a country. Look, ladies and gentlemen, for example, the United Nations peacekeepers in Sarajevo. How is it they sequestered the Bosnian Muslims and the Serbs together, ladies and gentlemen, and this led to the massacre of 18,000 Bosnian Why Muslims? Nation, we tell you also, no, sir, that in the troops in Cambodia, how is it, ladies and gentlemen, that out of all these peacekeepers, 18 out of 21 other platoons that were sent for intervention could not communicate. They could 
could neither speak English, Black, French or Cambodian, and they could not communicate effectively with the refugees. No, sir. And so we tell you, members of the House, that we can tell you and quote you example after example of how is it that the kind of policies that humanitarian intervention entails just simply hasn't worked, members of the House. And so we tell you, no, madam. There is one last point that I want to get out of the way, and that is the idea of how is it that the imposition of arbitrary armistices don't work at all. For example, ladies and gentlemen, the Dayton Peace Accords. It condemned Bosnia to three armed camps, and during the ceasefires, what happened, members of the House? The three armed camps basically went on to regroup themselves, rearm themselves, and what happened, ladies and gentlemen? The problem wasn't solved. So we tell you quite simply, members of the House, that humanitarian intervention doesn't actually work. So we tell you, members of the House, that instead of humanitarian intervention, what we would want are economic sanctions, which work, for example, against South Africa's apartheid regime. And we tell you, members of the House, that we want cooperation of international peacekeepers with the domestic government, because that is the only way, ladies and gentlemen, we are not going to have the kind of popular pressure that comes from the lower levels, ladies and gentlemen, and that's going to make our work a lot more easier. And we tell you quite simply, members of the House, that at the very end of the day, because we have got to do what works and filter off what doesn't work, we tell you, members of the House, that we believe humanitarian intervention is ineffective. This House would not sacrifice national sovereignty for the sake of human rights. You see, members of the House, when you have a problem of human rights abuses, the question is not how to do it, but when to do it. You see, when you have these problems, when people are suffering, you have to take care of the matter soon. You must take care of it as soon as possible. But unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the alternative proposed by the opposition simply will not work because they aren't really talking about the operational reality of today. So let's just clear up a few things that the opposition have brought to you today and we will see why there is no reason for the motion today to fall at all. First, the question of Indonesia. They, they came up here and said that, well, Indonesia invited all these peacekeepers in, ladies and gentlemen. So, there is no sacrifice of national sovereignty. If you look at it, Indonesia has already sacrificed its own national sovereignty in order to bring in the, these peacekeeping uh, troops from Australia in order to alleviate the human rights abuses there. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't a clear case of the moment they detected the problem, they invited the peacekeeper in. No, ladies and gentlemen, only after, much coercion, only after much persuasion, forcing members of the House by the IMF, yes, by yes, other yes, economic yes, forces, no, thank you, sir, only then could they could they actually bring about a system in which there was intervention, there was people going in when the Indonesian government by itself could not deal with the situation. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, the two main ideas advocated by the, by the side of the house, that you don't have knowledge and therefore there will be exacerbation. And the second part is that there are alternatives. The first case, ladies and gentlemen, deals with the fact that, of course, you won't have the locals going in to help the people. We agree that in the best circumstances, it will be the people with the best knowledge of the region going in to help the people. Unfortunately, in these cases, what happens is that, number one, either because of the lack of resources, which is something very common in the African subcontinent, uh, in the African continent, and also about the fact that there is no proper governmental or economic infrastructure to leave about the alleviation of human rights abuses. Again, ladies and gentlemen, Sometimes these governments themselves, like Afghanistan, are responsible for the human rights abuses themselves. Are we then going to say that these best people with the best knowledge should be allowed to deal with the human rights abuses? No, ladies and gentlemen, that is not the case. Furthermore, they believe that the situation in Bosnia was where everybody was divided into three armed camps and as a result, they continued fighting. I beg your pardon, members of the House. What happened in that particular situation was that yes, there was a split into three separate nations. And what happened? The war stopped, ladies and gentlemen. In case you haven't noticed, the conflict is coming from Kosovo, not Bosnia, not what Serbia, the sir? not neighbors of the house, but Croatia. No, thank you, sir. Furthermore, they believe that we should take them time. Let them deal with the problem themselves. They know best. Look at the situation. What the the How sir? many years did he take to kill all the people in that particular time? They say, uh, members of the house, these people will actually lead to the exacerbation because they don't have knowledge. No, thank you, sir. But the fact is, UN peacekeepers went into Cambodia. You have Australian peacekeepers in East Timor. These people may not necessarily know the languages by heart, but understandably, members of the house, they are translators, they are interpreters. Everything will still work out. Again, members of the house, they believe that there will be hostility. But hostility comes when you have Serbians supporting the Serbs, but you don't see the Croats and the Muslims supporting the Serbs anymore members of the house. That is the situation we want to find out. 
They said that the Iraqi people did not work with the UN teams. Wrong. The Iraqi government did not work with the UN inspection teams. The UN food relief teams, the UN peacekeepers, were actually advocated and members of the house, the people in Iraq actually needed those supplies. And again, the short point on alternatives. Let's just deal with this very quickly, members of the house. They believe that rogue nations with a dictator in place sometimes, with a clear intent of protecting the national sovereignty, will actually give in to negotiations. You think that the government of Burma, with China, sir. no thank you, sir, with human rights abuses since 1962, is going to give in? You think, members of the house, that Slobodan no Milosevic gave in to negotiations? No, he did not. What needed was an intervention. That is why government and national sovereignty have to be sacrificed. Right, Having dealt with those two, thank you, sir, let me move on with the case of opposition. And I will deal with what fundamentally the point about signals being sent. And my first case deals with the signal of accountability. You see, members of the house, what you have fundamentally with intervention, with the, elite, with the elevation of human rights above that of national sovereignty, then what you're going to say to everybody else is that you can't just use this principle of sovereignty, national sovereignty, which was important after World War II, because you need to control self-determination, but you can't use it as a shield anymore. You can't use it as an excuse to say that, hang on, everything that happens within our nation is okay because we're in charge and we should be dealing with the situation. Members of the House, it tells them that abuse of human rights is not controlled by the international community. It tells us, hang on a moment, that the international community cares about the new moral global paradigm. Is that not desirable, sir? You're not saying they're not going to do anything. They're going to say they're going to like in China, they're going to have sanctions and diplomatic pressure risk. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. But you see, if you are talking about all these, these are measures that will not work either in, in, in the first place because they are resistant to it, or number two, it will take a long time. We can't wait for the 20 visit, years. Sir. No, thank you, sir. 20 million people to die before the systems actually work. If you look at the situation of Bosnia members of the house, the reason the Kosovo invasion was so successful was because of the fact that a clear situation was already seen in, in Bosnia when the United Nations went in and made it clear that we will not have the ethnic cleansing. We will not allow for ethnic fighting with members of the house. And that is why Slobodan Milosevic, after the intervention happened, it was a clear case in which he could withdraw and members of the house, what we saw was a paradigm of respecting a paradigm of points of accountability. Yes, sir. Deny then what the International Center for Global Politics says when it points out that in fact the NATO peacekeepers made it amenable for the KLA to conduct ethnic cleansing post invasion. Sir, 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 <laughs> what is happening with the Kosovo Liberation Organization right, uh, army right now is the fact that they have had to turn in their weapons to the NATO peacekeepers. They have had to hand in all the officers, members of the house. In fact, they are not the government there. What you have right now is a stable situation in which the Kosovo community is being rebuilt and the situation of human rights abuses are being alleviated. And that is why we see that today's case must be there. Furthermore, we see the case of Mozambique and Burundi when they decided to accept UN peacekeepers see the chain of events in Ethiopia and Eritrea of the house. Clearly a case for the signal of accountability. And the second point, which is also about the signal, is a small extension to my own case about the signal of accountability. You see, members of the house, one way is to tell everybody that we will come after you and we will check and balance whatever human rights abuses you perpetrate. Another way is to actually show everybody that the positive way to go about is to elevate human rights and in order to do so, bring about a new millennium in which we have a new moral global order. We have the members of the house, the signal said that respecting human rights is the way to go. We, have, we, we actually see a new century in which these governments can actually come out, members of the house, change the ways of the past, and this is the way to do it, by actually telling them that they don't have national sovereignty as an excuse anymore. Human rights should be elevated to this case. Just look at the case of Iran. It used to be quite a scary situation in that particular country, with Tehran, uh, one of the most dangerous cities in the world. But what you see right now is the advent of democracy. What you see right now is the freeing up of the political arena. What you see right now, members of the House, is the clear case in which there is more greater respect for human rights. Isn't that the respect you want? Isn't that, members of the House, the signals being sent by the elevation of human rights above national sovereignty? And this House says human rights is all. Ladies
ladies and gentlemen, for those of you who are here for the previous debate, what we see over here is another example of Western cultural imperialism. Obviously, our second speaker of the proposition has been listening too much to Rockefeller's gang. Right here, right now, right here, right now. Too impatient, too ready to go. Now, we are telling you that we do indeed support the fact that human rights is the way to go. However, what we are complaining about is whether infringing on national sovereignty in arbitrary intervention is indeed effective of solving the problems. Now, the second speaker of the proposition came up and told us today that, well, we have to solve the problems immediately. And why? There's this whole emotional rhetoric about how people are dying, how people are dropping dead like flies. But we're telling you, ladies and gentlemen, that first of all, why not try the other alternatives first? And secondly, who are you to decide how long these alternatives should work? How long is too long for negotiations to work? And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we show you that the other alternatives are indeed effective. Because, ladies and gentlemen, we don't want to be like the second speaker, no, thank you, sir. We don't want to go in there and jumping with our guns flaring. Now, given this, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> Now given this, first of all, we show you that we want the human rights problems to be solved. But what we are going to tell you is going to push this a little bit further about how infringing on national sovereignty makes things worse. Worse. And we're going to deal with this on all the examples, ladies and gentlemen. Now, first of all, let's look at the case of intervention. Let's look at Bosnia. Now, what really happened in Bosnia, although they didn't tell us, ladies and gentlemen, is that the Serbs were strengthened. The evil Serbs were going around killing people. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, it actually, information, no, thank you, sir. nationalistic outrage <coughs> increased their power even more, and the human rights abuses continued. Now, if you look at the case of Kosovo, even better, Why it is it no, thank you, sir. It exacerbated the refugee crisis. It increased the support of Slobodan Milosevic. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, what you have is that now the dictatorship is bolstered. Now there's no change in the regime, and there's no effective difference from what happened before and what happened after. Only that, ladies and gentlemen, that you have a dictator in I'm power so, much more firmly. No, thank you. Now, <coughs> they talked about the KLA, and they are telling us that, well, it's fine because the KLA is disarming and all the arms are suddenly, poof, going one fell sweep. Now, well, ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you again, something tricky is going on right here for the proposition because, like Western media, they don't give the full picture. Once again, we tell you, we tell you that this is similar to what is happening in Sierra Leone. And quite simply, what the KLA is doing is that it's supplying arms for funds, then it gets them, and then, like in Sierra Leone, gets the funds and buys more weapons. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, infringing on something bolsters all the causes and all the main reasons for human rights intervention. Now, find <coughs> information, sir. No, thank you, sir. Let's save it for later. Now, we look at alternatives, ladies and gentlemen, and we showed you that the alternatives do indeed work. Now, what they told us in East Timor, <coughs> is that, well, there's an infringement on national sovereignty. But what they are really trying to concede to us today, ladies and gentlemen, is that our alternatives work. It's the diplomatic pressure... <coughs> no, the, oh, hang on one second. Is that... Oh, no, hang on. Um, it's that diplomatic pressure does indeed help to make Indonesia more amenable with cooperation and more amenable with working together with the international community. Oh, yeah, and then, <coughs> now we want to look... <coughs> now, what we want indeed, ladies and gentlemen, is cooperation. Then they come up and they tell us the whole problem about Africa, about sanctions don't work. And they tell us that well, these countries lack resources. Exactly because of this, ladies and gentlemen, exactly because they need the, the kind of of money, they need the kind of goods that are going into the economy, that's why the sanctions are more effective. And all the more, we should have this as an alternative to what direct measures. No, thank you, sir. Now, the first speaker brought up the whole point about the food and aid administration. And they said that, well, we support food and aid because of the benefits. Now, ladies and gentlemen, what they are doing is simply committing what yet another crime of bringing up examples which are not relevant to the not relevant to the motion, just like in East Timor, just like the food and aid administration. Well, let's hear about it. Sir, if you want to alleviate the human rights abuses, aren't you contradicting yourself by imposing economic sanctions which will make the situation... No, thank you, sir. Now, the whole problem is about national sovereignty. And we are telling you that, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, we do not want national sovereignty... Uh, imposing sanctions on a country does not infringe on its national sovereignty but, ladies and gentlemen, it can solve the problem. And therefore, what is the reason for having these priorities? Because you can, you can have, there are two principles in the UN Charter, you can have one without infringing on another, and you can effectively solve problems. Given how, ladies and gentlemen, that the <coughs> infringement on national sovereignty and arbitrary intervention well, does you, not sir. really work, no thank you, madam, let's hear our substantive and maybe we can have another POI. Now, first of all, we show you that 
the arbitrary intervention and cause of human rights, which in itself is a rather weak yardstick, is a dangerous precedent because, first of all, ladies and gentlemen, it violates international law. Now, we know that they're both the point of right, enshrined, no thank you sir, are enshrined in the UN Charter. First of Article 24 of Section 1A of the Charter of the ICJ does say that both rights are present, no thank you sir. Now therefore, if you arbitrarily put one right against the other, it brings down any clear judicial framework for action and leads to the legislative or military anarchy. What we are here to decide, ladies and gentlemen, is that quite essentially there is nothing that says that one right precedes the other. And therefore, who are you to decide what is human right in violations and what isn't? And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, if you start infringing on national sovereignty, which is the basis of international law, you lead the way to, <coughs> to of taking the action of jumping the gun without the effective legislation being placed. Now, what signals does it send off? And this, no, thank you, sir. This is directly against your case. <coughs> the signals that are sent out, ladies and gentlemen, is that, <coughs> is that it's okay to intervene if the US is backing you. It's okay to intervene if France is backing you. Now, what quite clearly, ladies and gentlemen, it's impossible to make major advances in intervention without help from the foreign powers. But what happens is this. When the foreign powers, the powers use their discretion, they start deciding, all right, Iraq is our favorite bad guy, but Israel is okay, even though 37 UN resolutions have been passed against it and no action is taken, and Turkey is okay. Why? We don't know. But maybe it's because of national interest, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe it's because you have an arbitrary line to draw, and that sometimes you can intervene and that is bad, sometimes you can't. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the signal that you are sending out, the signal is that <coughs> is, is the signal that you send out is that you sometimes it's all right to infringe on human rights and sometimes it's not. Now ultimately, they are going to tell us and they might say that well, what we should have is a consistent policy. But ladies and gentlemen, we tell you that it's precisely because you cannot have a consistent policy. That's why it's detrimental. Now when you talk about intervention in large countries, ladies and gentlemen, you obviously can't. You can't intervene in the US because they are shooting civilian, unarmed civilians. You can't intervene in China because of Tibet, Fargo, or Tiananmen Square dissidents. Because essentially, ladies and gentlemen, this will disrupt the kind of regional and global security and stability that exists at this point of time. You can't intervene in Turkey because it's a buffer between the Middle East and Europe. You can't intervene because you are afraid that it will swing Islamic tendencies back the wrong way and suddenly extremist groups will come in. And for these reasons, ladies and gentlemen, you cannot have consistent policy of intervention. And because of this, and once you infringe on national sovereignty, you send out the wrong kind of message to others because of human rights. <clears throat> now, we showed you quite essentially in the case of China, while you cannot intervene, you can impose sanctions. You can try to dangle the economic carrot of the WTO in front of them. And all this, ladies and gentlemen, that's what they have signed the International Covenant of Human Rights. They have released political dissidents like Wei Junshan and Zhao Wei. Now, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, we tell you that we support human rights. But ultimately, when you look at the clearer picture, we cannot support this as a solution because we are not media freaks. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I am worried for the world because if I were to follow the methods and the means of the opposition today, the people of the world and their welfare cannot be preserved. Because if they, we want to use their half hearted means of using economic sanctions, diplomatic means, we are going to see a degradation of human rights into the world today. So ladies and gentlemen, I will deal with their case on three lines of logic. Firstly, the idea of the violation of international laws and the intervention is such. Secondly, the idea of other alternatives. And thirdly, ladies and gentlemen, the idea of exacerbation of the problem. Now firstly, moving into the first line of logic about that how intervention is a violation of international law. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that in the United Nations Charter, Articles 2, Part 4 and Part 7 clearly specify that under certain conditions that intervention is permissible. And ladies and gentlemen, under these conditions is when there's human rights abuse and when the need for the people, international community to go in. Now, thank you, sir, to go in to alleviate widespread misery widespread suffering and death in countries. So ladies and gentlemen, when they tell us that it is a uh, violation of international law, I tell them they are mistaken. And secondly, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you that in African nations, in the organization of African nations, have a consistent policy of intervention. And this is where other countries in Africa, because they have the knowledge of their people, they know the area, they know the 
uh, relationships between countries. This allows them to go in. So when they tell us that, oh, uh, one country doesn't know what the situation is in another country, I will tell you wrong. There's a consistent policy in the African nations whereby members of the African community go in to help out another. So ladies and gentlemen, that line of logic clearly falls, clearly showing you the benefit of intervention and how it helps preserve the welfare of society. Final information, sir. No, thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, when they said that Turkey, there's major problems and nobody wants to intervene in Turkey, I will tell you that when the United States and the United Nations went in and showed the Iraqi people and showed Saddam Hussein that he cannot treat the Kurds like that. They sent out a clear signal to uh, Turkey that the Kurds have to have equal say. And under Turkish law, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you no. Thank you, sir, that the Kurds have a voice. So you are sadly mistaken in telling me that the people of Turkey and the Kurds are not supported. Then, ladies and gentlemen, I will move on to the next line of contention and their whole big idea about other alternatives. Now, ladies and gentlemen, they spent about two speakers here talking about how we have other alternatives and this will save the world, and how this is much beneficial than going in, say, with jumping, the, uh, jumping in with guns blazing. But, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you, your methods such as economic sanctions, diplomatic measures, and negotiations are half-hearted methods which have political no effect. Sir. Yes, sir. But unless, but unlike you, uh, you direct humanitarian intervention, they don't actually exacerbate the situation. Thank you, sir. But your half-hearted means have no effect on the people. And you, your half-hearted means of economic sanctions still see people die. So, ladies and gentlemen, I know. Thank sir. you, sir. I tell you it's better to go in and use intervention and have to save lives but rather than sit outside and say, oh, I'll give you a punitive fine and then have people die. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you, sir. I'll tell you that leaders such as Slobodan Milosevic use economic sanctions, use diplomatic measures as a time delay factor, ladies and gentlemen. They use this to delay the attack uh, intervention by other countries. They use this to further exacerbate the problem because you're uh, sitting there and saying, oh, we have a problem with you, but we're not going to deal with it because it, we don't want to. So ladies and gentlemen, this sends out a clear signal to the people, to dictators, that oh, they're not going to do anything to us except maybe put a fine on us. So ladies and gentlemen, we can go and torture people. So I will tell you on that line of logic, your argument of alternative measures falls. And I will also tell you that economic sanctions, in fact, your idea is ironic because it in fact exacerbates the problem. And how does it do so, ladies and gentlemen? They say that this country has a certain amount of resources and therefore if we in impact economic sanctions, the people that uh, the country, the leader will change his methods and then will result in the saving of people's lives and the preservation of human rights. But I will tell you that because economic sanctions take such a long time, they in fact impart a negative effect on the people and result in the further exacerbating thank you, sir, of the suffering of the people. And I will tell you an example of South Africa. It took 30 years, ladies and gentlemen, before and your thank economic you, sanctions work. Yes, sir. So who are you to decide when or how political negotiations should actually stop? Thank, thank you, sir. Obviously, you have a flawed and naive understanding of the world today because I will tell you there are consistent policies in Europe, in Africa, in the United Nations, in the Charter of the United Nations that govern the intervention of uh, force. And I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that in Libya, Gaddafi sat there and laughed at the rest of the world because they said they'll put in economic sanctions and in fact he hasn't changed his behavior. He's still carrying out torture. And so we show you clearly, ladies and gentlemen, that your argument of or other alternative, no, thank you, sir, other alternative measures fall. So therefore, ladies and gentlemen, clearly showing to you beneficial nature of intervention and how it results in the preservation of the welfare of society. Then, ladies and gentlemen, they talked about how it exacerbates the problem and how the lack of knowledge about people and how policies are ineffective and they're counterproductive and how the United Nations isn't the solution and also that the United Nations leads to the perpetuation, perpetuation perpetuation of abuses. Ladies and gentlemen, the op wants to ask to show to you that intervention is perfect. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I will tell you no. And while I'm here oh, debating that sir. intervention is good, no, thank you, sir, I think you should listen to this, I will tell you that intervention cannot be perfect. But it's beneficial oh, because, you, no, thank you, sir, there are minor flaws, I concede. But ladies and gentlemen, the great beneficial nature it brings about is far greater, in effect, be, uh, beneficial to the people who are suffering than, no, thank you, sir, your, than, than your other alternatives. And I will tell you, you have disregarded the number of successful operations, such as in Ghana and Liberia when United Nations went in. And I tell you, even in Somalia, that even though there was a problem about uh, 
the American soldiers being killed. I will tell you that there was a result in the beneficial nature towards the people because there was fighting was stopped, fighting was reduced, and the refugees, no, thank you, sir, the refugees were helped. The Red Cross could come in because there was an international organization dealing there. They had the means and the ways to come in and help alleviate the problem. So, ladies and gentlemen, when you tell me economic sanctions are, are working, I will tell you no because they do not allow the Red Cross and other international organizations to go in and help the people. So ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to deal with that. Then ladies and gentlemen, they said that it brings about nationalistic feelings and how that in Saddam and Iraq, the people of Iraq uh, had increased nationalistic feelings and wanted to support Saddam. And also about how Bosnia and the Serbians went behind Slobodan Milosevic. But ladies and gentlemen, what they have failed to realize is that in Bosnia, the people who were being tortured were not the Serbians, but were the Bosnian Muslims, ladies and gentlemen. And if you did not stand there and watch them, uh, did not intervene, what you realize is that more hundreds and thousands of Muslims would have died. So ladies and gentlemen, I tell you that they have been coerced and people have been coerced and gullible to believe that, that people actually support because the people who are being tortured do not support the government. And in fact, they greatly appreciate the countries that sacrifice men and people and women to go in to intervene. So ladies and gentlemen, I show you in the case of El Salvador and how the civil war was solved and the human rights abuses were rectified when the United Nations went in. I show you in Congo and the crisis and how they solved it. So ladies and gentlemen, would you rather stand outside and watch people die or go in and save these people? The motion today must stand. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see of the events of the last week, I've been spending a lot of time at home. And I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that I've had a lot of opportunity to watch television. And last night, if you watched the 10 o'clock show, Bugsy, you'll remember something that Warren Beatty said. He said, we got to get in. we got to get in now. And ladies and gentlemen, the fact of the matter is this Chicago Mafia attitude, which that side of the house has been propounding, is exactly in line with the kind of abuse that we see rampant with intervention, ladies and gentlemen. The kind of dangerous precedent is set. They want to jump in gun, guns blaring. That's exactly what their third speaker said, ladies and gentlemen. Jump in guns blaring. But well, that sounds a lot to me, like something straight out of a Bon Jovi song. Quite frankly, what this means is that they are going to bypass diplomatic negotiation. Their second speaker said it himself. We don't want to wait anymore. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We want to get in now bypassing diplomatic negotiation. And so, what they're effectively saying is that don't let the British wait for the troubles in Ireland to, to burn out. Don't let them solve it by diplomatic negotiation. Jump in. Ever heard of Bloody Sunday, ladies and gentlemen? Ever heard of the British parish troopers which killed all the orange men, ladies and gentlemen? Somehow, it works. We were waited 30 years after that for anything to come out of it, ladies and gentlemen. What worked? Diplomatic pressure. David Trimble's government, ladies and gentlemen, that worked. Let's move on to the three lines of argument put forward by that side of the house. First of all, which was the bulk of their case, and which what I believe the entire case rests on, the fact that it will alleviate the problem, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to spend much of my speech dealing with this. Secondly, they talk about the signal it sends out, ladies and gentlemen, the signal of hypocrisy, the signal of whatever. And finally, I want to deal with the lies put forward, and I use that word, ladies and gentlemen, because I'm very sure that the third speaker has fabricated much of this argument, the notion of international law, ladies and gentlemen. And let's deal with these one by one, and we'll show you how fundamentally they've mistaken the issue. And if you look at real world problems, ladies and gentlemen, humanitarian intervention, we are fine. It's not perfect, but it's made it worse. Now, they say it alleviates the problem because, well, we can get food and medication. So sir. thank you, sir. First of all, that's not the point. Food and medication can be sent in without violations of national Why sovereignty. Sir. They themselves, no thank you, sir, considered in their first speaker that it's not an issue. What we want is to send in troops. Humanitarian intervention, ladies and gentlemen, not humanitarian. No thank you, sir, not humanitarian aid. And the fact of the matter remains that they, by their own definition, are irrelevant, and that's half the first speakers. Substantive. Next, they decided to say that, well, in fact, it works in certain circumstances. We put forward to the House that it exacerbates the entire I situation. Sir. They never even touch our argument, ladies and gentlemen, that it breeds hostility, that it breeds continued support, perpetuating rogue regimes. All they said is that the Croats and the Muslims don't support them anymore. But the fact of the matter remains that Why the Serbs the support sir. the Serbian government, ladies and gentlemen, and enables a perpetuated disagreement between the people. Now, 
What we told you, ladies and gentlemen, consistently, is that they fail. They haven't alleviated the problems in most of the circumstances. They, our own example of the killing fields in Cambodia, we tell you that upon the departure of the United Nations peacekeeping troops in Cambodia, ladies and gentlemen, remarkable as it seems, a greater proportion of the territory in Cambodia was in the hands of the Khmer Rouge, the people who were genocidal, ladies and gentlemen. They, in fact, did not solve the situation. They didn't even make a significant improvement in the situation. A greater, thank you, sir, proportion fell in the hands of those who are genocidal. Why, ladies and gentlemen? Because they fled with their tails between their legs. They didn't leave, ladies and gentlemen. Once they solved the problems, they just got out because they were on the losing end. And next, they talked about Somalia. Well, we'll tell you that the forces intervening in the Somalian conflict in fact facilitated the genocide by collecting the refugee Tutsis in centralized areas in Mogadishu. Thank you, sir. sir. Allowing the rampaging Hutus, ladies and gentlemen, to simply charge in, rape and pillage. Then they, want to talk, so you, sir. then they want to talk about refugees. Refugees, their own example of Bosnia. But Alan J. Cooperman from the Institute of the Study of World Politics states very clearly that it was a mistake to send in those 5,000 US troops to Bosnia. Yes, yes. What did they do? They put Bosnian Muslim refugees in the same camps as Serbs in Sarajevo. Why yes, that's going to help the situation, ladies and gentlemen. 18,000 Bosnian Muslims stand testament to that fact. Yes, sir. So you cannot deny the fact that despite all the little hiccups that you might have had, <laughs> fundamentally, you very much have fundamentally, fundamentally the they solved the problem. Well, let's look at their own example of Bosnia. Five years after they sent in the people, ladies and gentlemen. In fact, the arms continue to be circulated. In fact, ladies and gentlemen, they haven't established the foundations for concrete political process. Yet, Why in fact, no, thank you, sir. sir. Recently, ladies and gentlemen, the incapability of the entire force was signaled when the senior Why British official sir? Michael Birch quit the UN trans National Administration in Bosnia. Why? He accused his colleagues of losing the trust of the Bosnians by building an empire and through their insensitivity to the local conditions, ladies and gentlemen. Five years. They tell us we don't want to wait. Well, they've been waiting quite a long time. Yes, sir. In fact, you're mistaken on your five years, and I will tell you that the United Nations laid a groundwork for economic, political, and social reconstruction. Thank you very much, sir. There hasn't been this kind of economic, political reconstruction. That's precisely why Michael Birch quit in exacerbation, ladies and gentlemen. That's that's precisely why. You see, in fact, the Dayton Accords enforcing greater division amongst the armed camps in Bosnia, ladies and gentlemen. That's why you see a prolonging of the conflict, precisely because those very accords, which they claim work, ladies and gentlemen, instilled an artificial ceasefire, which gave them the opportunity to rearm, resupply, recruit, and fight even more. Thank you, sir. What works? Don't you? Diplomatic pressure works. Economic sanctions work. It worked with China, ladies and gentlemen. It worked with Appetite South Africa. They say it doesn't work when the government is culpable. Appetite South Africa, China, it worked, ladies and gentlemen. Let's move on. So thank you, sir, to this next point after I've dealt with the majority of their case. They want to talk about the signal you sent out. And they come up with this jingoistic line, ladies and gentlemen, the moral global paradigm. I'll tell you fundamentally that in the real world, what happens when you intervene is that you find out global scapegoats. You use, ladies and gentlemen, the United Why Nations Declaration of Human Rights. Well, thank you, sir. As a bully puppet, through your artificial, through your arbitrary intervention, ladies and gentlemen, what you really send out, the message you really, really send out, ladies and gentlemen, is that if you want to commit a human rights abuses, you had better have the European Union on the side, like Turkey, ladies and gentlemen, with regard to the Kurds. You had better have the United Why States. Well, thank you, sir, on your side, like the United Why States, sir? like Israel, ladies and gentlemen, with 37 United Nations resolutions passed against them and not a single course of action taken against them. Why? Precisely because they've got the backing of the Israel lobby group in, co in Congress, ladies and gentlemen. And this kind of message which they send out is one of hypocrisy. It's one of blatant hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen. Why which we find sir? disgusting. No, thank you, sir. This is in fact exacerbated by the fact that the peacekeepers are often culpable in these violations. We brought you up the Belgian peacekeepers in Somalia, and we told you about Rwanda. And now this tiny little point on that of international law. They quoted Article 2, ladies and gentlemen, the right to education. They quoted Article 4, the right to government. Nowhere does it say that it's a clear right to intervention on human rights abuses. In fact, the often misquoted quote, ladies and gentlemen, is Article 34, Section 1A, which does not in any way enumerate specifically that you are allowed, ladies and gentlemen, to delegate national sovereignty to human rights abuses. It only upholds customary law, which is based on precedent, based on the previous rulings of the ICJ. And the ICJ has previously objected to interventions without invitation, ladies and gentlemen. And the United Nations Secretary General, Kofi Annan, has condemned the bombing in Kosovo. Why? 
intervention without invitation, intervention by violating national sovereignty. And that's the basis on which they stand. That's the ideological basis on which they stand. One of hypocrisy, ladies and gentlemen, one of exacerbating the situation. They claim they uphold human rights. They claim that they are going to help the 18,000 people who were in fact killed in Bosnia, ladies and gentlemen, precisely because they didn't want your help. They are going to help all the people who were dragged through the streets of Mogadishu precisely because of your Belgian peacekeepers. Ladies and gentlemen, they are not going to help at all. Thank you, Mr. Blue. Uh, Substitute speakers, now I have a very good afternoon. Now, after this whole debate, we get the idea that the government stays at home and cries in bed at night for all the thousands of people that are dying because we delayed the kind of humanitarian intervention which they say saves the world. Now, I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, that we come across as very harsh and ruthless people because I can assure you that that was never our intention. Indeed, we tell you, members of the House, that we are practical, that we show you practical love, that we tell you, members of the House, that you want, ladies and gentlemen, to save the people. You're not going to have direct humanitarian intervention. What you're going to do, use your brain, think. Use economic sanctions, use, ladies and gentlemen, foreign assistance and cooperation. Now, members of the House, at the very end of the day, we have two real issues that have come up throughout the course of this debate. The first, members of the House, is the idea of the kind of signals and the kind of messages that it sends out in principle. And secondly, whether or not humanitarian intervention actually works in practice. Now, members of the House, let us first go on to the idea that somehow or another, you will have to have humanitarian intervention in order to show that you, ladies and gentlemen, are able to take up that commitment of showing that you will not tolerate human rights abuses. And here, ladies and gentlemen, we have repeatedly asked the questions. Why is it that when a country imposes trade sanctions, why is it, ladies and gentlemen, when we place a trade embargo on another country, why is it, ladies and gentlemen, any less showing of our intolerance towards human rights abuses, ladies and gentlemen? In fact, we tell you, members of the House, that we don't need to bring it to the extreme, especially if it exacerbates the problem. You want to show signal of accountability? We show you signal of accountability. It's just that we choose a different, more practical way of doing it, that's all. Indeed, members of the House, I'm very sorry that the second speaker needs the United Nations to tell whether or not human rights abuses are wrong because I thought that was very obvious. Now, members of the House, indeed, when we bring it one extension further, we tell you, members of the House, that if anything, humanitarian intervention actually sends out the wrong message. Why, ladies and gentlemen, my second speaker has told you quite clearly, members of the House, that if anything, what's going to happen is that the people, the countries of which the humanitarian intervention occurs, are going to think that it is hypocritical. Why? For the very simple reason that United Nations are uh, united. United States, sorry, for its own vested interest, doesn't bother to intervene in Israel, doesn't bother to intervene in Turkey. And yet, ladies and gentlemen, it rigorously pushes for the protection of human rights in other countries, which less concern it directly. So we tell you, members of the House, that if anything, direct humanitarian intervention is hypocritical and it sends out a wrong message. So we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that on the point of ideology, on the point about morality, ladies and gentlemen, we show you practical love and not just rubbish. Now, Member City House, let us now go on to the point about practice, Member City House. We show you, Member City House, that our viable alternatives have worked. And why do our viable alternatives work? Now, let us consider their concern about duration. And they tell us, oh, many, many people are dying every day. What's going to happen if we delay by one day is that many other people are going to die because of us. Oh, I feel so guilty. Now, Member City House, what you need to understand, quite simply, is that if humanitarian intervention goes into this country and exacerbates the problem, then it is not because we don't want to save these people, but simply because there is no panacea that allows you for a direct relief of the problem. And when we, pick, when we have foresight, ladies and gentlemen, when we look at it in the long term, we tell you, members of the House, that it is not in our interest to whip up nationalistic support for the dictators, for the countries. We tell you that it is not in their interest just to make a principal stand, to make it counterproductive for you to actually intervene and cooperate with the countries, ladies and gentlemen, that you want to help. So so quite simply, members of the House, we tell you that our viable alternatives have worked in China, in South Africa, and even as they consider themselves, the Irish disputes burn out themselves after 30 years. So we tell you quite simply, members of the House, that in practice, the viable alternatives that we have told you work. And what's more important is that because humanitarian intervention doesn't work, we tell you, ladies and gentlemen, quite simply, we believe that we would not sacrifice national sovereignty for human rights. opposition, let's talk about love. They've talked about practical love, but we've really questioned that. Do they actually love human rights? Do they actually love the people out there? Or do they simply have a love for numbers, for articles, for law, for all these things which are written down, which does not necessarily represent what the operational realities are out there? Members of the House, their kind of love 
One is to see the burning out of conflicts, which tells you, ladies and gentlemen, you would rather see a situation in which everybody has finished slaughtering each other, everybody is dead, and then there is peace and conciliation, the end of the conflict. Is that the kind of love I want? I wouldn't be this each other. Girls out there, beware. Members of the house, frankly, what you have is two major areas of clash in today's debate. The nature of national sovereignty and the nature of addressing human rights abuses. In the first issue of the nature of national sovereignty and the sacrificing, what they basically said is if intervention is fundamentally ineffective because what you're going to be doing is to jump in with the guns blazing, members of the house, ignoring everything else. But yet, what they could not fundamentally prove was the fact that these are ineffective because in the end, what you sure was that clearly there was an end to the conflict. In the end, what happened was that even if all the problems in the world was not solved, it wasn't a panacea, it allowed for a cessation of firing, it allowed for the end to the conflict so that the people might be grouped, so that the refugees might be allowed to get home. It wasn't all about guns. My first speaker started off with the Red Cross and the fact that it allows for the reconstruction of the economic and social infrastructure so that the people might get the food, so that food agencies might be able to get in. On that point, their case fell. Then they talk about the exacerbation principle in which because the people are going in without clear knowledge, without members of the house, clear language capabilities, you can make the situation worse. Again, we question the validity. Do you need to understand the language and the terrain perfectly in order to get the situation to work? No, ladies and gentlemen, what we've advocated and what we've highlighted to you was a situation in which, in a clear majority of the circumstances, these people have gone in, have adapted members of the house, and have actually seen in, in the resulting successes, such as in East Timor and Kosovo. These are the situations in which you clearly see that a clear technical knowledge is not necessarily uh, required. Then they talk about illegality. Again, their love for that has come about. You see, they believe that it is against the law. If the law says so, we can't do it. Members of the House, we've already shown you a case of prior precedent in which they've already operated along these lines in order to protect human rights abuses, as seen in Africa and Europe. And we've also shown you, members of the House, that there is actually a case of human rights law. Maybe it's not written down as concretely as the case of national sovereignty. But members of the House, are we allowed to let letters in black and white get in the way of the red blood that will be split with human rights? Then they talk about the lack of common morality. Everybody is going to have an arbitrary definition. Well, members of the House, all these people with different versions of morality did come together, as pointed out today, and signed the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There is your common morality. Another second smaller point, which is all they could advocate, was the case of alternative. And the fact that alternatives and sanctions in the case of addressing human rights abuses will be effective. Ignoring the fact that sanctions take time, ignoring the fact that with sanctions, you're going to have the burning out of conflicts, and then they say, well, then sanctions are effective. Clearly not acceptable in members of the house. And again, you see the situation in all these countries made worse because of the sanctions, because these people with human rights abuses are given a double punishment of economic sanctions. Again, a situation which is not acceptable. Again, the motion today must stand. We also advocated diplomacy, which is well and good. But in the vast majority of circumstances, we've shown you already that diplomacy has failed, that diplomacy will not work with rogue regimes and rogue nations in members of the House. Clearly, what we need is to how to stop the human rights abuses. We need to bring in the help, the food, to eliminate the suffering, and to send out the signal. For the welfare of society, today's motion must stand.